Hey everyone, it's Norm from Tested and I have another figure review as well as a simple workshop or office project for you today. It's a lighting project and it's something I've been meaning to do for my own office for a while, but hopefully it'll be useful for you and you can follow along as I make a custom lighting fixture for my display cabinets. So along this wall here in my office, I have my display shelves and it's just Ikea shelves, Ikea cabinets. Um, I think they're totally useful, uh, not too expensive, lots of different variety in terms of looks. And I have a nice big one here, as well as, as you can see, this is like the classic Ikea glass display shelf. It's the Detol. You can get it for like $60. It's been around, I think I've had this one for almost 10 years now. And for collectors of figurines, six scale figures, vinyl toys. It's a great way to display your collection. But the one thing that I'm not super happy with with this Detolf is the built-in lighting solution or what the, the manufacturer offers. You know, they do have a light that you can stick through the top. It's a small light that doesn't really make its way through all the four levels here. You know, these are 15 by 15 by 15 for each of the shelves. And sometimes people, you know, set up dioramas in here. You kind of want better lighting. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the kind of even bright light, the kind of museum style lighting, or to make it look like almost like you're at a, a convention uh, for these figures. And so for that, I'm gonna turn to some LED strips. Now, you can also buy some LED strip lights that are made for cabinets like this. Home Depot, Lowe's, they sell them. I'm not the biggest fan of those either because those more often than not, you can see the bare LEDs. They're not hidden that well. And that look of the space of the LEDs when not properly diffused, it's a little bit garish in my opinion. Plus the Detolf, it's all glass. All four sides are visible. And so I want to find a way to display them these lights and have the fixtures installed so that the LEDs are facing away from me toward the figures and, and basically hidden away. And one solution that I've found that people have also done is this V-mount corner bracket. It's basically, uh, it's like a, a V right here and the LED lighting strip is just wide enough that you can then affix it along here. And if you want to mount, you can mount it, you know, vertically, horizontally. My plan is to mount this horizontally using some double-sided tape. And for each of these levels, have the lights shine right on to the figures. Uh, and for the LED strips, I'm just using standard 2835 LED strips. I'm gonna go with daylight white, a cool white, as opposed to a warm white. And I don't think I need the 50-50 LEDs, don't need them, that many lumens for a cabinet of this size. This is super affordable. This is super affordable. You can actually get these really long, about a meter in length, and cut them to size yourself. But I did find a retailer that sells this at 12 inches perfectly fitted for a Detolf with diffusion as well. It's gonna require a little bit of soldering, some custom wiring, because I want all the LEDs to still be on one power supply. And so the wires are gonna to have to snake their way along the four shelves and then find their way into an outlet. It's gonna be a little bit of work, but not that difficult, I think, of a project and I have all the components I'm using listed in the description below. So let's head over to the soldering station, build our custom fixture, and yeah, let's also talk about these figures as well. Let's go. So let's start by recapping some of the hardware we're using here. Uh, the LED strips are super basic. These are just one color temperature. I chose the bright white ones and you can get them for about a dollar a foot at uh, this style. This is the uh, 2835 style of LED, which means the diode themselves are 2.8 millimeters by 3.5 millimeters, uh, which are brighter than the old 3528s, but not as bright or as versatile as the 5050s. Those are the square five millimeter by five millimeter LEDs. Uh, these 2835s also just have two contact points, just power and ground. So also keeps it simple for the soldering, uh, but also you can still dim it. So it comes with 
uh, a power adapter and it comes with a dimmer switch uh, and you can cut it to length. I like buying these at a very standard about 16 feet and then I'm only going to use four feet here because the channels themselves are only a foot long. So we're going to measure and cut them to size uh, and then make sure they're all soldered together. And of course, test them at each step along the way to make sure the power is getting to all the strips. We can also take a look at how well these lights diffuse under uh, this diffuser sheet. And you know, even though the lights are spaced out, to my eye, as I get them pretty bright, uh, it actually looks pretty nicely diffused. If you get up close, yeah, you can still see the individual diodes, but with that diffusion strip, much better than just having the bare LED strip. The thing that makes this fixture work is going to be this channel, this aluminum channel that has a V shape with a diffusion track. Uh, and the lights are going to be mounted at an angle uh, and that channel that they mount on is about 12 millimeters wide, which is plenty for the LED strips we're using and also allows me to have a little bit of wiggle room when I'm adhering the strip to the channel uh, so it doesn't need to be perfectly straight. Um, and these you can get uh, six of them, a pack of six for under 15 bucks. So all in all we're talking about under $15 worth of just the aluminum channel uh, plus less than $4 worth of LED strip out of the pack I'm getting. Uh, plus you're of course bringing along some solder, some wire, and you'll need some double-sided sticky tape as well to stick the whole fixture to the glass. So once we have our LED strips cut to size, about a foot each, we're gonna need to connect them all using two wires a piece, one for power and one for ground. Uh, the wires here we're using are just some standard flexible silicone wire. These are 30 gauge, I believe, which works great. They're nice and thin. Uh, and we need to make sure we have enough length for each uh, so that we have enough slack to wire from shelf to shelf. The shelves are about 15 inches tall and the fixtures aren't going to go end to end. So I figure adding a couple inches on each side, two and a half inches on each side should be enough. So we're going to cut them to about 20 inches in length, which gives me a little bit of wiggle room if I need to sniff the wires closer. Uh, but I do want to make sure that both my power and my ground are exactly the same length here at 20 inches. And to make sure we're measuring properly, we're going to use our Savage Industries tape measure. So time for the actual soldering itself. And the first thing I want to solder is our power outlet. So I have these adapters that allow me to wire the power and ground to an adapter, a barrel adapter that let me connect to the power supply because I want to make sure I'm testing each of the LED strips uh, along this chain as I'm soldering. So I want the whole thing connected to power at the very beginning. And we're just going to do some quick solders joints here using our favorite USB soldering iron and please excuse my poor soldering technique. So for each of the strips I've cut them at a point where there are the two copper contacts exposed so it's really easy to solder the wire. Just a little bit of dabbing right there for the ground and the power, making sure they're not touching, of course. Um, also, I have some heat shrink tubing that I've made sure to, to slip through the wires. So for both sides, I can cover up this connection point uh, with a little bit of protection at the end. All right, so while the other meat is soldering, let's talk about some Iron Man armor. And I have a few of my favorite Hot Toys Iron Man pieces here today because at this point in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we're, we should be Iron Man complete, right? Tony Stark is done at the end of Endgame, and so the his whole collection, his whole line of Iron Man armor, um, we've seen from Mark 1 all the way to Mark 
85. Uh, so you got a couple minutes. Let's go through the, the history of Iron Man armor. Of course, Mark I. He built that in a cave. The uh, callback to the classic uh, the first appearance of Iron Man, very bulky, plated steel. Uh, it's functional, got him out of the cave. Uh, Mark II is really the first real Iron Man armor he built. Looked very similar to the Mark III, but of course, again, all silver plated. It didn't have that cooling solution. Solve, it's the armor that Rhodey borrowed to make War Machine in the subsequent sequels, uh, and more riveted look. Also a lot of exposed wire look in terms of it being disassembled. Really cool design, but really it's Iron Man Mark III that that suit came to fruition. Just nailed that Addy Granoff concept art look, taking a little bit of a inspiration from his Extremis armor from the comic books, but definitely something that they made a practical suit out of and really proved that they could have Iron Man in cinemas on screen look just as good as he did in the comic books. Then you move on to Iron Man 2, the movie, and he starts there with the Mark IV. Not my favorite armor, and if you look at some of the Iron Man armor, one of the things I always look to is maybe the, the ab lines here, uh, and I like the ones with the wider lines. The Mark IV has what I consider, I, I call the droopy lines. They dip a little lower. Um, had a little bit more of that gold trim uh, on, on the panel lines and some of that trim. And so just not my favorite design. They mixed it up just a little bit. And then they quickly moved on to the Mark V, which is unique because it's the suitcase armor. Packed real tight. Again, a callback to the comics. Uh, he fought Whiplash in, uh, in, in the racing scene. Um, but then that was just for the one scene. And by the end of the movie, he moved to Mark VI, which uh, is a riff on Mark IV. Again, has that droopy ab look, that not my favorite design, but also has the triangular arc reactor. So a unique design there. And that's where he showed off some of the new weapons, like his uh, laser that cut through all of those mechs. That's the same armor that he starts off in Avengers for, the Mark VI. And Avengers only has two Iron Man armor, Mark VI, and I think my favorite in terms of the early design, the Mark, uh, the, the Marvel Cinematic, Cinematic Universe Phase One design, which is this guy, the Mark VII. And I consider the Mark VII maybe the peak of the, what I would consider like the aerospace-inspired Iron Man armors, and Hot Toys did an incredible job. It's one of my favorites that came out uh, last year. It's their 400th movie masterpiece series figure, uh, which they're reissue or redesign of a Mark VII die cast. I've talked about this one before. Has a, a matte finish here, not a really shiny finish. And I actually really like this deep red matte finish. And in this movie, for Avengers, they kind of bulked up that Iron Man armor for the Mark VII. He needed more armaments. He had the missiles coming out of the arms. All the, the shoulders got bulked up because they needed all the armaments to fight off that attack on New York. And I think really it's one of my favorite uh, Iron Man designs. Uh, you move on to then Iron Man 3 and so many armor appear there. He jumps all the way to Mark 42. That's the, the prodigal sun armor, the one that's more compartmentalized. It's modular. He can control it remotely and he can actually have it fly to him and, uh, and, and suit up. Um, in, in individual pieces. I'm not going to cover all the differences between the Mark 8 and 42. That's a long list of armors that made its appearance in that house party protocol. But some of my favorites are the Centurion armor. Again, call back to the comics. You had the Igor armor appear. That was almost like an early Hulkbuster, as well as his uh, his armor made for space flight, that, that, the, the, the white armor. But really, the 42 made its way to the 43 in Avengers 2, Age of Ultron, which is a recolor of the 42. It's a more red aesthetic. And the 43 actually sits inside the 44 because the 44 is the Hulkbuster armor itself. Veronica, again, unique design, beautiful execution, amazing fight scene in Age of Ultron. At the end of that movie, he does move on to the Mark 45 and not a big fan of that armor either. It was a little bit overly CG look, in my opinion. Uh, has maybe a little bit more of an exoskeleton look with uh, some of those negative spaces, a little bit too much of a too too much of a Ultron look in my opinion. Um, and not, not one of my favorites. But they quickly went from that to in uh, Captain America Civil War to the peak uh, pre-nanotech armors, the Mark 46 and subsequently the same design recolored Mark 47 that we saw in Spider-Man Homecoming. And the Mark 46 and 47 have all the attributes of the, the refined design of all the sleek panel lines. You have all these mini arc reactors, which I think is a callback to the Marvel, uh, the, the heroic age uh, style design of Iron Man armor in the comics. 
And the recolor of that in the Mark 47, where it's all silver underneath with just the red top, I think that is a tribute to the ultimate Iron Man uh, color scheme. Not the exact look, but just that paint scheme. Really love the Mark 46 in Civil War and the Mark 47 in Homecoming. But then he jumps a couple ahead in Infinity War with the first nanotech armor that we see in the Mark 50. And so in Infinity War and Endgame, you see the Mark 50 and the Mark 85. Not sure how they exactly got to those numbers, but there are leaps in technology. The 50, it's good. It's solid. He fights Thanos in it. But in terms of the design, it's maybe a little organic for my taste. A lot of curved lines, these parallel lines that go through and you lose you lose the rivets completely and you lose that aerospace look. It does a lot of, you know, uh, kind of nanotech armaments, which looks really cool in the fight. But I think it's not until they get to the Mark 85 in Endgame, and it appears halfway through the movie as they're doing their time heist, going back to the first Avengers movie in 2012, that we see the Mark 85. And this, I think, may be my favorite Iron Man armor of all time. It ha even though it's nanotech, it has uh, the color scheme that is right back to the comics with the gold in the arms and the thighs. Um, and it has even in the, the face mask and the face plate, the pointed tips right there, which is again, uh, I think right out of the comics as well. It is nanotech armor, but it has this balance between this organic look in terms of you know the plating looking like muscles, uh, but also still looking like plating itself. And Hot Toys did an incredible job here with this, with all the lighting, with the interchangeable arms, so you can be holding uh, the Nano Gauntlet as well, Nano Infinity Gauntlet. A uh, bunch of swappable hands if you want him firing his Repulsor Blast, uh, as well as a uh, Tony Stark likeness head sculpt. Uh, it does fully light up, as you can see here, and it just, the, the, the engineering that they've done to make something that on screen was only CG, and again, the nanotech design, uh, but still have that articulation where it can do all the twists and turns and bending of the arms and the plates actually bend to get out of their way. Um, so you can fold the arms up. You can see as I'm folding that bicep up, it actually moves the plates, moves the shoulders. The shoulders look like large pauldrons. I just love the silhouette of this guy and the design of the Mark 85, and it has the wide lined on the abs as well, which is my favorite and a callback to the Mark 7 and the Mark 3. Um, there also is a release of the team suit armor uh, just for the Tony Stark version, although people have been swapping their head sculpts. And this does come with, I think, probably my favorite Tony Stark head sculpt. It's very similar to the one that came with uh, the Mark 47, uh, but he's a little more aged and uh, you can easily swap this guy and put him on the Mark 85, which is how I've been displaying him. So there goes. Uh, maybe a not so short overview into the history of Iron Man armor in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And if uh, you're looking into collecting, my highest recommendations uh, would be the Mark 7 and the Mark 85. All right, back to the soldering. Okay, back to the soldering. And this is just repetitive, busy work. But I do have to remember that for each of the LED strips, I have to make sure to include two of the heat shrink tubing covers, because uh, I can't put those on afterward uh, when I solder both ends of the wire. And I want to make sure that each of the pairs of wire are the same length uh, so that they're not unevenly stretched uh, as I snake them around the cabinet. I'll do one final test at the end and everything's lighting up. The last steps here are now to actually put some heat to the heat shrink tubing uh, with the standard heat gun. Uh, and then as well as finally, then taping the LED strips, removing that sticky backing and taping them to the aluminum channel themselves. I want to save that to the very end just to make sure I have all the wiring secure and done properly and not rush to do that first. Same with adding the diffusion channel. That's the last step. And it's a pretty tight fit, uh, but it nicely covers up that entire LED strip. And once everything's complete, I have basically four light bars here, aluminum light bars that are wired together uh, 20 inches apart and ready to put some 3M sticky tape on the back and stick them to the cabinet. All right, now we're back in my office at the Detolfs. And for each of these light bars, I'm using some 3M double-sided sticky tape to fix them to the underside of the glass shelves. 
Uh, it's really, really sticky stuff, not very forgiving. So I'll be pretty careful to make sure it's centered and make sure there's still clearance for the door to close. And I want to start from the bottom up. So starting from the lowest shelf uh, where the power will be connected, making my way up. And yeah, that 20 inches of wire is plenty of slack for each of these shelves. So I can then uh, zip tie them to the rail on the left and right sides uh, and just tighten them up just a little bit to make sure they're nicely hidden. You could also, um, if you had longer heat shrink tubing, encase that uh, in heat shrink tubing as well, but they're pretty out of the way and when uh, tightened with some zip ties, um, barely noticeable. All right, there you have it. I think the lights look fantastic. Such an improvement over the stock lights that came with the Detolf. It's nice, evenly lit across all of the shelves. I can dim them. I can turn the maximum brightness. I, I like somewhere in between, so I can still turn on the lights on these figures and have that still shine. Uh, but it's such a nice improvement and such an easy project to do as well. Like I said, about 20 dollars worth of actual materials between the brackets and the LED light strips. You just got to do a bunch of soldering with some wire uh, and it just works not only for the detail, but you could do this for your Billy bookcases, you could do this for your Calaxes, really improve your IKEA shelving like I have so much at my home here today. Hope you enjoyed this little project. Hope you enjoyed that dive into the history of Iron Man armor. And now I got a new figure on my top shelf, that Mark 85. All right, I'll see y'all next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.